how much you have. For example, um, don't use a cliche, don't use a saying, he's dead Jim is not a passphrase. That's an invitation <laughs> to be robbed. Um, now, here is my passphrase from 16 years ago. Come closer, my darling child, but not too close, for I too cannot be trusted. It, it's a mix of two different translations of a, the book that largely created the Surrealist movement back in the 1860s. Um, I can still remember this, including where all the damn commas are. I'm gonna, you were gonna have a hard time guessing that or brute forcing it. Mm -hmm. um, for the record, I am not recommending that you read this book, <laughs> just that's where I got it from. Um, and my current passphrase is longer and more obscure than that, but yet, if I forget it, I can easily obtain it again. So, Find something that's, that is unique to you, an old book that you inherited from your grandpa that went out of, from like, you know, 18 something. Uh, a magazine, a life magazine from the year your dog was born. <laughs> Grab a piece of text, play with it a little. A, a modified nursery rhyme is okay, but there's a lot of nursery rhymes, and it better not be hickory dickory dock. No, no. There's how about, how about a personal golf swing uh, like uh, key mantra that you use for your own swing? Do your friends know it? No. Because I've been at this a long time. I've got my own own. Okay. If if nobody knows it but you, but you're going to remember it, it's, it's a good shot at a passphrase. So, um, why kill passwords? Um, passphrases are kind of a weak two-factor authentication. A file isn't really a thing, but it's better than just a password. Uh, there is the SSH breaking cloud. Now, I, I want to be clear on that this Hail Mary cloud. Um, people use posts they break into as more bots. They use it for computing purposes. They use machines they take over as uh, uh, DDoS traffic generators. So, am I saying that you are a bad person and you are making the world a worse place by not locking out this cloud? Yes. Yes, I am saying that. Kill your passwords. <coughs> and, you know, shutting up the smart SSH scanners is, it, is nice because you do read your logs, don't you? So, about now people ask about... <laughs> <laughs> okay. There you go. Are we, uh... Someone... Oh, too bad. Someone called. It's about now. Everybody's complaining about that. Your passphrases are way too long to type every time. Yes. Perfect slide for that. Yes, absolutely. Your passphrase should be too long for you to type every time you want to copy something from one machine to another. That's where an agent comes in. An, age, an SSH agent takes your key file, accepts your passphrase, and stores the decrypted private key in memory, never to disk. It specifically never swaps it out, never pages it out. Um, when you SSH to a host, the SSH client asks the agent for your, I'm sorry, for your key. The slide is wrong. So you can type your passphrase once and use it all day. This means you never type a password to log into any of your regular machines, except for the machine where you, that belongs to a customer where your account name is Jerkface. <laughs> so, 
there are risks to using an agent. How much time have I got? 30 minutes, 35. 30, 30. Okay. Oh. We do have giveaways. So yes. When you walk away from your machine, lock your desktop or tell your agent to flush the key from memory. Because uh, you don't want someone, <coughs> Brian, to come walking up to your machine and log it in just to fix something quickly. Uh, on a multi-user <laughs> machine, if you have your if you have your agent running on a multi-user machine, you know, some of us remember one computer, thirty hardwired terminals around it. You probably don't, and some of you probably still have one of those running somewhere. You probably don't want to use an agent there, and. You've got to be careful about other sysadmins breaking into your machine and messing with you. Not that I have ever done that, but... <laughs> <laughs> so... Um, copy your key to the file. Um, home s .ssh authorized keys. Uh, readable by everyone. Remember, this is a public key. But it should not be writable by anyone but you. Do not copy and paste your public key because your copy and paste will screw something up and it won't work. Um, so use a proper SSH copy tool to do that. Or there is a, a little script SSH copy ID included with OpenSSH that you can use to copy the key around. Often, copy and paste will add a character somewhere like in the middle, change a space, yeah. and you're doomed. Line feeds. Line yeah. feeds. But if, you, but if you're careful with it, you can use copy and paste if you don't get the extra space. If you're careful with it, in theory you could. However, I've lost count of how many support calls mm -hmm. I have been on the receiving end of where I say, no, no, we're going to copy your key again. No, don't copy and paste. Use it. Fine, no, use SCP. And, it, oh, it works now. Imagine that. Thank you very much for calling support. Click. I get you. Um, so don't do it. Okay. Or if you do, don't call me for support. Right. Because <laughs> I, I will cut off your hands and bury your keyboard. <laughs> so. The SSH keygen command uh, for your open SSH client. It generates your key. It asks you for a passphrase. You enter the passphrase twice. It creates the file with sensible settings for the age of the client you are using. It picks it up automatically. It says, oh, hey, here's a key file. Enter the passphrase. Boom, you're in. Now, the agent combined with a, a Unix window manager can be weird. You may have to start a shell. You may have to start the agent before starting your window manager. It depends entirely on how your breed of Unix is glued together. Modern Linux is just to take care of that for you. Modern Linuxes mostly do, except when they don't. And when they don't, they will drive you to madness. What's the modern system? Well, Ubuntu and, and uh, uh, yeah. the Red Hat one. Fedora. Yeah. Sorry? I didn't catch that. Uh, Ubuntu and Red Hat usually take care of it for you. I'm going to say usually because sometimes it doesn't happen. Well, there's, there's one special case with Ubuntu that I've run into where if you have all of your keys in your .ssh directory, Mm -hmm. You can run into a situation where it will stop trying keys because you will have you'll have, you'll have tried your six keys or whatever in that directory. Because what it will do is it will load everything up initially into the agent, so you won't necessarily have control over what order any of those keys get tried on the remote system, oh, you know, which can be a real pain in the tuck. Oh, yes. Right. Yeah. Yes. Okay, that kind of answered my question. Well, it gets even more fun when you use like. SSH libraries, like libssh and yeah. SSH2. Ter which... Terrible things can happen with this, just so you're aware. So, uh, 
Um, this slide included notes <coughs> just for Jeff. <laughs> um, there's a putty program, putty gen. It's a Windows GUI. Click, click, generate, wiggle the mouse for entropy. Not that that really helps. Um, it uses the cats. It, it does amuse the cats. That's a benefit. Um, select conversion, export OpenSSH key. This gives you your public key. You have no choice but to copy and paste this. Um, be very, as you suggested, be very careful. So, the first time you try using a key and you've uploaded the public key to the server, try it without an agent. Make sure the key itself works, that you didn't botch the copy, that key authentication is actually enabled on the server. It comes that way by default, unless your vendor hates you. Um, I'm not going to name names here or anything like that because for me to shout out AIX would just be rude. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, uh, so just as a note, last month we did a thing uh, on the um, using the Amazon Web Services. Yes. I went through some of the, the putty and putty gen stuff. Yeah. And that's uh, recorded and put out onto YouTube. So oh, go cool. back into our previous stuff if you want more information on that. They have a, a nice tutorial for our audience at home uh, for last month on PuttyGen and Amazon. So Putty's agent is called Pagent. Um, you, can, you enable it in Putty. And you can start, if you have a Windows box, you can create a startup shortcut that loads your key at boot, uh, which is what I do yeah. for my Windows box. Okay, now let's talk about key files in general. Making a key file is not a one-time thing. At a minimum, you should use one key per client machine. Don't share them. Do not share them between machines. Do not share them with other people. Now, I have this thing where I go through a laptop a year uh, because they are flimsy and chintzy. And what I really need is a 17-inch la laptop made by DeWalt. <laughs> <laughs> so, every time I get a new laptop, um, and, and now that I'm doing a lot more test work at home, I have an OS X machine on my desktop, I have Windows, I have FreeBSD, I have OpenBSD. Um, I have some virtual machines running with you know, lesser operating systems. But every one of those that I use as a client has its own key. Because when I destroy that machine, I remove that key from all the hosts that it could connect to. Because over time, um, well, I created a key to uh, get access to the FreeBSD project back in 1999. If I had kept that key and still used it everywhere, um, that key would be crackable by the slowest smartphone in this room in about a sneeze. By creating a new key for every machine, I'm pretty current and up-to-date. Um, what, what's the oldest client machine we have in the room? I mean, a realistic day-to-day -day machine, not the Vax you boot every five years as a stunt. Five years? Anyone have a machine older than five years? Okay. That, that is a well-loved laptop. You should probably update your SSH client software at some time and create a new key. But for most of us, a couple, two, three years, new machine, if we're professionals, new machine, <coughs> new client keys. Oh, and when you create a key, make sure you use the note field to say which machine this key belongs to. Because otherwise, you have an authorized key file that contains 
dozens of keys and you have no idea which are actually relevant. So, once you get through and you know your key auth works, turn off passwords and SSH key. This will shut up the cloud. Um, turn off challenge response, turn off password auth, pub key authentication should already be on. Uh, there are questions about using PAM, yes or no, with SSH. I, I, I say questions, what I really mean is argument. Uh, if you're using PAM, if you are using PAM features, then use PAM. There was a release, a recent security issue between OpenSSH and PAM that gave some trouble for FreeBSD systems. Now the the OpenSSH developers are, they are not afraid to call something a bug. They will happily say something was stupid, whether it's them or someone else. And this particular problem they classified as an oversight. <laughs> so, you do, ex you do increase your attack surface by having PAM available. It, it, Rarely turns out badly, but it can. You need it? Yeah. Yeah. So, everybody has someone who can't be bothered to enable, uh, to come up with keys to log into the system. My last job, it was part of a, it was one of the company owners who's going to get to it sometime. And it wasn't who you think it was. Um, so, for this one user, you can go in your SSHD and say, okay, this subnet, you can't do it on a per user basis, but you can per subnet. That, or better still, you give that person's client PC a static IP. And you, you allow passwords there. So, one interesting thing is agent forwarding. Once you've logged into a machine, you can send requests for your SSH, SSH agent back to your client. This means you can log into one machine, SSH from there to another, and then to another. All by sending the requests for the private key back to your desktop. So you never have to send your private key elsewhere. Um, this makes it easy to say copy files from one machine to another. Now, SSH agent forwarding works by creating a socket on the machine. Anyone who can access the socket can access your agent and send requests. So the question on all of these intermediate machines is, do you trust root? Do you trust the machine? That is a question for your network. You do have to enable forwarding. Now, to be honest, I generally, I enable forwarding because my network is small and wussy. At, at some large enterprises, there are reasons not to do it. Okay, any questions so far on that? Okay, let's talk about port forwarding. We're going to go over this very clearly, um, or sorry, very briefly. Um, port forwarding is the big kahuna of SSH. It is what makes SSH so powerful. It is what makes the security auditor twitch whenever the word comes up. Um, and it's why us network and server types love it, because we can just tinker toy stuff together. So, whatever your organization is, obey their security policy. I am not responsible for you getting walked to the door by two silverback gorillas who have an attitude with you. Although I do want to hear all about it. <laughs> <laughs> Port forwarding. Local port forwarding. 
grab a port on the local machine and you attach it to a remote host. For example, at one point my website was, did not have an SSL search. I'm using WordPress. WordPress for administration needs a username and password. Um, so, and at the time, SSL search still cost something close to real money. It was more than lunch. So what I did is I used SSH local port forwarding, and I forwarded port 443 on my machine to port 443 on my web server all over SSH. And then I open up my web browser and do one HTTPS colon slash slash 127.001. And hey, I'm accessing my web server. Uh, the traffic is encrypted over SSH and being passed to that remote port. So local port forwarding lets you encrypt a service that isn't normally encrypted on a machine that you can SSH to. Um, I even know someone who, God help us all, used local port forwarding to encrypt Telnet. Wow. Um, the, the reasons for that were entirely political. What was, what, I'd like to hear just a little about that. What, what is we're political? A little, uh, we're, some people don't want to update, and they have the power in the organization that they don't have to. So, yeah, remote port, port forwarding. You grab a port on a remote machine and you attach it to your SSH client. This is where you are, say, <clears throat> behind your company firewall at your Unix workstation. And you log on to your personal server out on the internet. And you forward port 222 on that machine to port 22 back on your workstation inside the firewall. You leave that session up, running in the background, you lock your workstation, and you drive home. That evening, you log into your web server, and SSH to port 222 on your web server, and get ported, get poured through your still open SSH connection back through all the layers of security into the corporate organization. Um, this is an incredibly powerful tool. Use it wisely. Um, if you happen to work at Ford Motor Company, I'm going to advise you not to use it. What will they do? Um, well, I don't know, but I'm sure we'll find out if it happens. <laughs> the gorilla's name is Chris. Give it back there, they don't mess them off. I, I, I've, I've seen some things used with proper authorization. I mean, you have to go through the saying what the risk is and qualifying oh, yes. it, documenting it, all that type of thing. Yes, if you can qualify and document it, it's a great thing. But remote port forwarding is why organizations with big security admins and risk assessment are loath to allow outbound SSH. Because what you're really, they, they cannot eliminate port forwarding from SSH. It's not like, it's not like web requests where they could block all CGI requests at the firewall. Uh, it's part of SSH. You can do this. And there's nothing they can do to stop it. There is no proxy. So, dynamic port forwarding is uh, an interesting little trick which turns SSH into a SOX proxy. You, SOX is an old proxy protocol. Um, if you can go to your web browser, open up network connections, and it'll give you space to put in proxy information, and the last option is usually SOX. Now, my home network has this unholy carnal knowledge of my 
mail server and my web server, and I, I have things glued together all kinds of horrible ways. Um, because it amused me when I set it up. Now and then I need to look at my site or test my services from a different host. I'll, I have a free OpenBSD account uh, out at DBS. I'll open up a uh, SSH session, open up dynamic forwarding, tell it to open a SOX proxy on port 9999 of my laptop, tell my browser to use that and use the remote DNS, and it will funnel my web request out to that remote machine that has nothing to do with me and turn around and send it to my web server like I'm coming from a whole different network. Uh, very useful for remote testing. And many programs speak socks. So, and that is the end of the talk. Um, and my missus and uh, Joseph Atkinson, who is a FreeBSD developer, insists that I have to say, buy my books, all of my books. So, with five minutes left, uh, are there any questions? How much do your books cost? Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Well, my books cost varying amounts. Uh, anything from 10 bucks for an e-book to uh, 60 bucks for some of the big, thick textbook type things. And I can give you a more detailed price list later. Um, Yes, I have a box of books, and in fact, speaking of giveaways, I have a giveaway. For the person who can tell me, let's see. Here's a copy of my SSH book. Let's see, I asked, did we, do we have anyone still using our login, RCP, outside, outside of the lab. The lab. <laughs> <laughs> you lab Better idiots don't easy. count. Um, how about Telnet? For mail servers. Other than to talk to a router? No, no. Yeah. <laughs> uh, mail servers don't count. Okay. I'm, sorry, I'm sorry, Telnetting to port 25 does not count. Okay. <laughs> Telnet servers. In a Telnet table. server to get a command line. I need to save an old HP printer. There are, yeah, okay, we device. have a winner. Um, <laughs> not proud of it. You're not proud of it? What's your name, sir? Jeremy. Jeremy. I actually have that, so if you want to give that to somebody else. Oh, well. Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, in the internet, Jeremy has just admitted he still uses Telnet, and he already Are owns you? the book. <laughs> what do you use Telnet for, out of curiosity? Uh, that's not a Okay, I use it because I have to. Oh, we have another hand. Yes. So I work with Merit Networks. And um, our head of IT told me recently that they use Telnet everywhere in a safe area. <laughs> <laughs> what? Apparently there he's, never, he's never heard of layered security. Um, okay. So, I'm, I'm not going to repeat the name of the organization for the camera, but your boss is using Telnet in a safe area. Uh, you do not win this book. Your <laughs> boss does. <laughs> and good luck. Anything else? Thank you. How about uh, Thank you. Nice to